All right, so hi, uh, I'm Josh Tannenbaum. I've had a chance to sort of chat with almost all of you. Uh, I'm a new hire at UCI uh, in the Department of Informatics. I, I just started in July, uh, and I, I have a lot of sort of fun, exciting things that I'm trying to do. I'm trying to hit the ground running. Uh, where I'm calling my, myself, uh, my wife and I work together in this space, we're calling ourselves the Transformative Play Lab. Um, and I've got a bunch of pictures that are just our stand-ins for research initiatives we're starting uh, within our group. Uh, a lot of my work has to do with how one designs games to support experiences of cognitive uh, transformation, of becoming a character. Uh, and of getting empathy for somebody else's point of view, and I ground a lot of that work in techniques from method acting and theater. And so I, I have a background in costume design and costume making, among with many other sort of weird hobbies, uh, and I try to use my hobbies to inform my work wherever possible. Uh, and so we're doing work on, on looking at costumes and wearables as game controllers. How do you, you how does changing an uh, actor's or player's perception of themselves visually or how they're perceived socially affect how they identify with a character in a game? How can you use outside-in techniques of design, both uh, in the virtual space but also in the physical space of the player, to create opportunities for empathy and transformation? Uh, we also do work in, in tangible design and wearable design. Uh, this is my wife's childhood dollhouse. Uh, we have a team of students in a class I'm teaching right now who have augmented it with RFID tags to uh, work as a visualization tool for a piece of ubiquitous computing technology that they've proposed for the class. Uh, we also see it as a possible platform for an electronic storytelling piece that we want to do where we uh, collaborate with people in the School of the Arts and Dance to record <laughs> actors uh, performing a Victorian ghost story in a green screen space and then use augmented reality to situate that ghost story inside the dollhouse uh, where the actors will play out their, their various dramas and, and the player will perform the role of the house and have to unhaunt itself. Um, we have this notion of playful fabrication. We just got a 3D printer in our lab. Uh, this is him or her. I, we haven't assigned a name to our printer yet. Um, we're interested in looking at, from a DIY standpoint, how you can think about 3D printing and home fabrication as an expressive medium, as a platform for communication. And so we're looking at what happens when you network together multiple 3D printers and treat them as a game design platform, uh, where they're producing tokens or producing resources for a game, and we're using game design as, as a window into uh, new expressive possibilities in the space of 3D printing. Uh, we also do work encouraging STEM identities and learning in girls through transformative play. Uh, I was talking to somebody about this a little bit earlier. Uh, this is a workshop we ran at Maker Faire a couple years ago on building your own steampunk goggles. Um, we've seen that there's a lot of really interesting work that can be done in encouraging girls' interest in STEM at a young age through hands-on activities. Uh, but one of the realizations we've had is that the biggest problem in the uptake of STEM is not in technical skill, because all these girls are incredibly talented and skilled, it's in social narratives of gender and science. And so looking at transformative play to push back against those, those social narratives and create opportunities for girls around middle school age to inhabit science identities for themselves um, in addition to doing the, the kind of hands-on DIY learning and practice. Um, I'm at four <coughs> minutes. Uh, finally, uh, we're interested in doing work in chronic health conditions and invisible disabilities. Um, I'm diabetic. I struggle with my diabetes a fair amount, and a lot of my experience of being diabetic has been that I have limited agency because I come to events and there's food that's terrible for me and I have to eat, and so I live in a context that is conspiring actively to kill me. Um, and what we find is that people with chronic health conditions, people who suffer from invisible disabilities, uh, they often lack the ability to express the ways in which they don't have agency in the world, and so they're treated as the victim or they're treated as the sort of person at fault for their own disability or their own illness rather than being sort of implicated in the broader system. And so we're interested in designing games that build empathy for the issues that you deal with when managing a chronic condition uh, that are targeted towards people who don't have those conditions, that are targeted towards uh, addressing the issues of context rather than the issues of individual health. Finally, I'm just going to do a quick scroll through pictures of the space that I have downstairs. Um, we have lots of fun toys. Uh, we have some 3D printers. We have some sewing machines for, for doing wearables. We have some nice electronics prototyping space. 
Um, and of course, we have a lot of games uh, because uh, my core work is still in sort of hermeneutic analysis of games and play experiences to drive new design poetics. And so that's my, my five minutes. I've got two minutes. I'm happy to talk about any of these things. I guess your lab is also people can go see at lunchtime or something. Oh, yeah, people can come see my lab at lunchtime, although I won't be there because I'll be teaching class and I'll, yeah. But I can open the door. Jim. Sure, yeah, I'm kind of curious the direction you're going with the, the um, uh, kind of costumes as controllers and their, yeah. um, So, a lot of method acting theory takes this notion of outside in, where you, you do the thing the character would do, you say the thing the character would say, you, you wear the clothes the character would wear, you put on the makeup. And as you do that, uh, identity transformation happens as a result. So rather than stopping and thinking carefully about your character, in performing the activities of the character, you experience this cognitive transformation. And there's a lot of really useful things that one can take from that lesson in a game design standpoint, ranging from how we design avatars to mirror the body language that we want a player to experience, to uh, what happens when we put a player in a costume. And so we have a, a very simple A-B study we're going to do over the summer with two of my students, where they're doing cosplay. They're making Mario and Princess Peach costumes. Um, and then we're going to play Super Mario 3D World with a bunch of people, both in and out of costume. Uh, and, and see how they articulate their relationship to the character identity. Uh, and part of this is that Mario and Peach are, are both iconic characters rather than really narrative characters. They're, they become symbolic stand-ins player, for players rather than characters that are heavily narrativized, unless, of course, you're uh, like a super fan, in which case you know the mythos of Mario. <laughs> uh, and so we're interested to see whether or not we can overcome that kind of tokenized inertia for those characters by giving people costumes and seeing how they respond to each other, see whether it changes their relationship to the character as an entity. Um, well, and I, I have some theories about what's going to happen, but I'm, I'm trying to remain agnostic and open to, to let the experiment show me what it wants to show me. Um, and then, of course, we do want to make functional wearables down the line. Like, like the, it's both form and function that we're interested in, but form tends to be something that's overlooked in wearable design. Uh, Google Glass, I think, failed partially. Uh, because it attended fully to function and didn't understand the ways in which uh, a wearable is a form of social expression, uh, is, is a communicative thing that you encounter in the world with people. Colin? And so are you thinking to extend that type of model as a multi-dimensional play or alternate reality gaming affordance yeah. or um, LARPing kind of thing, or are you thinking primarily around screen interaction? I or? think that... I think it has design lessons that can immediately affect how we design on-screen interaction. But uh, early in grad school, my wife and I came up with the stupidest acronym of all time, which was TUNE, Tangible Ubiquitous Narrative Experiences. Um, and the, the, note, the conceit of this was a, a theatrical set that you physically walk into and costume yourself for that then is, is an interactive environment that, that is literally immersive uh, that, and that you're materially immersed in it. And, and so I'm really interested in, in sort of the ranges of these things. We did a piece with wearable object-based storytelling where the objects had RFID tags on them. When you picked them up, it revealed a piece of narrative information about that object. And it was a very successful piece in some respects, but it's impossible to disseminate. You have to come to my lab to play it. And so it's very hard to find audiences for this kind of work. Uh, with the dollhouse thing that we're doing, one of my sort of secret ambitions for it, which is not so secret now, is that we actually don't want to use this dollhouse. We want to design a dollhouse uh, to be CAD cammed up and 3D printed and laser cut so that the whole thing is a kit. Um, and it can be distributed digitally and people can make the dollhouse as a kit and then do the interactive storytelling piece on it once they've produced it. Uh, so sort of converging our interest in, in, in fabrication with our interest in material storytelling. Uh, I think that's nine minutes. I think I've now overused my time. So thank you for listening.